Welcome to the Rutgers Cooperative Extension Compost Management School. These video presentations are designed to help you learn the principles of manure composting and the proper utilization of composted manure. In this video, we will hear from Fred Kelly on the use of compost as a soil crop amendment. I'm with USDA NRCS. I'm out of our state headquarters in Somerset. We have field offices that provide uh, technical assistance on private lands uh, all through the state. And uh, we also administer, uh, when you talk here about USDA programs, cost sharing for conservation practices, that's, that's us too. So uh, just a little background about that. I'm going to talk about, as Mike said, using compost as a soil amendment. And I'm going to give a little background first so that we're all on equal footing in terms of what goes on in the soil. A lot of you realize this and some of you may not, but soil is pretty much alive. It's not an inert mineral medium. A lot of times it's, it's treated that way, but there's so much going on in the soil in terms of natural processes, uh, exchanges of energy, and air, water, uh, fungi, bacteria, all interrelating with each other. And uh, there's a, a tremendous amount of natural processes and what goes on with those processes has a great deal to do with the fertility of the soil and the overall way that the soil functions, uh, whether it's for agriculture or on a golf course or an athletic field or whatever it may be. There's a complex food web that exists in the soil and it starts out with organic matter sort of as the, as the initial food source and it just moves up the ladder from there as you can see. And compost figures in very heavily into the food web because it's a very stable source of organic matter. You can see the process starts there and moves right through the bacteria, fungi, and nematodes up the next stage, arthropods, protozoa, and finally you're getting all the way up to mammals and to the point where humans are consuming what's coming from the soil. We know that there's different ecosystems uh, that we see that are on the surface of the earth, all different places in the world, different places in New Jersey, depending on the vegetation that's growing there, the soil that's present, the, the moisture, the animals and herbaceous plants that might exist would make up an ecosystem. But within the soil itself, there are little micro ecosystems where all these life uh, changes and exchanges of energy are going on. So that's, that's always something to keep in mind. That's kind of like the first take home message. It's just the recognition and the, and the remembering that soil is alive and that there's a lot going on beneath our feet. So part of the food cycle and the life cycle in the soil are the microorganisms. And they provide a tremendous amount of transformative activities to the organic matter and the nutrients that are there in the soil. So you've got uh, the five major groups, uh, bacteria, actinomycetes, fungi, algae, and protozoa. I found this next bullet pretty amazing, how much life could be found in one gram of, of topsoil. You can see it, the, the numbers are staggering. So again, just, uh, just driving that point home further. An important function is the breakdown of the organic materials where uh, we start to then create the basis for uh, healthy plant growth. Soil health, soil quality, uh, it's become kind of a couple of buzzwords fairly recently. I know with our agency, uh, it's, we've been hearing about it quite a bit for the last few years. And uh, the NRCS Soil Quality Institute, that's their official definition of what soil health is. And sort of to, to sum it up, it's how well does the soil do what we want it to do? We don't all want the soil to do the same thing. A vegetable grower has one need, an objective, and a, a set of goals, so to speak, for what the soil needs to provide to produce a, a good yield of vegetables. A golf course, a, a turf grass superintendent might have a different set. An athletic field manager would have a different set. Somebody that's involved in construction has a different set. So it's hard to nail down what soil health because it's, it, what, what it is because it's different things to different people. 
One thing almost all of us can agree on, though, is that soil erosion is, is a problem, no matter what your goals are, no matter what you're using the soil for. Soil erosion is often a symptom of uh, an unhealthy soil, because very often what will happen is because you don't have the life in the soil, because you haven't fed the soil with the organic matter and maybe managed the surface of it by keeping cover on the soil as much as possible, you then start to have crusting, you start to have more runoff, you're not taking in rainfall as well as you might with a healthier situation. You're going to have reduced structure, you're going to have compaction. And when you have runoff situations like this and erosion situations like this, you're not just losing soil uh, off-site into the streams where it's going to be causing sedimentation problems and uh, possibly algal blooms from the nutrients, <coughs> primarily phosphorus, that you're taking into those waters, but you're also losing pesticides and you're also losing money uh, if you're a producer. So it just, it's, it's more than any kind of esoteric goal, you know, uh, to keep soil in its place and to keep it healthy. It's an, e an economic goal, too. And uh, in practically any study that you can look at where different soil management practices were undertaken, when organic matter is maintained or added and cover crop is used and that soil health is maintained, it has a positive <coughs> economic benefit to the producer. So the benefits of a healthy soil as I said, it erodes less, it's more fertile, you'll always have better crop yields. You're going to have more absorption of rainfall, especially, you know, it's, it's become even more critical, the whole issue of rainfall absorption, because storms are more intense now. Uh, it's been documented that when we get the, you know, we, we talk about the rainstorms in one year, two year, five year, ten year intensities as far as the, uh, the, the likelihood or the percentage of getting that uh, amount of rain within a 24-hour period, it seems to come, we get more all at once uh, instead of it coming in a more gradual fashion. So if you have a situation where the soil isn't healthy, the fact that it seems to rain with greater intensity now has an even more profound effect on runoff. So uh, uh, maintaining organic matter and health in the soil is going to become even more important in the years to come. That, that picture to the lower right, this is, this is not a new idea as far as adding uh, organic matter to the soil. That's uh, just a photo I sa uh, found from New York State where uh, a farmer was just taking, taking wood chips and uh, was just going to land apply it, recognizing, you know, it's, it's, it's not rocket science. It's just from, from regular experience that that producer had found that adding carbon, adding organic matter to the soil had long-term beneficial effects. Um, of course, there's other issues uh, that I'll get to later if you're adding too much carbon at one time, but the principle is to get that carbon into the soil. So best practices for soil health. First one is to try to avoid soil compaction whenever possible. That's done by staying off whenever possible, staying off the field when the soil is saturated because when you get on it when it's saturated, you squeeze those poor spaces in the soil and sometimes you can never get them back to where they were before. Um, increasing organic matter, keeping cover crop on the soil whenever possible, uh, using integrated pest management, crop rotation is very important for both the uh, pest management aspects but also the soil fertility aspects, alternating leguminous crops with uh, non-leguminous crops. Some are fixing nitrogen, some are taking nitrogen, some have shallow root systems, some have deeper ones. All these help, this diversity helps to feed the life in the soil using nutrient management. By that I mean applying nutrients at the right time, in the right amount, and in the, in the proper location near the, near the row. Uh, being careful with your irrigation, and of course controlling uh, erosion. So where does compost fit into all this? Well, the obvious one is that it increases organic matter. Uh, and it feeds that life in the soil, and all those other benefits that, that go with uh, increasing the organic matter. The interesting thing with uh, compost is that, like you might wonder, how can adding the same material improve infiltration and at the same time improve the way moisture is held in the root zone? The two things almost seem like they're opposites. Well, it has to do with the soil texture. In a coarse soil, you're improving holding the moisture up in the root zone rather than losing it too quickly. Uh, 
in a, in a soil that's tighter, adding that organic matter then can help with infiltration. So it has benefits with, with the water situation in a crop field, no matter what the soil uh, texture is. And of course, if you're gonna be improving infiltration, you're gonna be uh, improving erosion resistance, and you're also gonna be improving disease resistance. And that's kind of a, an aspect of applying compost that uh, it might not seem that obvious, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit. Just a couple pictures, that's a canola field where compost was applied in bands two years prior to this picture being taken. And you can clearly see the variance in the way the canola is responding to growth. So it's, it's not something where, like an inorganic fertilizer, where you put it down and the effects are immediate, but then it's gone once the crop uses those nutrients that were in that fertilizer. When you're adding compost, it can have positive effects that can last for years. Compost reduces soil compaction. A study that Cornell completed 2001, they used a formulation of a third compost and two thirds of sandy loam. And they, in every situation, they found a, a, an improvement in the bulk density, which is a measurement basically of the, the porosity of the soil, it increased the, the soil pores and had benefit moisture uh, capacity uh, in that sandy loam. And if you're improving the compaction and the moisture situation, the drought stress is also going to be improved if you're, if you're using compost. So just a couple of quick pictures to illustrate some of the points that I just covered. So there's lots of uses for compost. Primarily we're going to focus on agriculture and crop production. And there's all different kinds of agronomic crops that can, uh, that can make good use of it. Vegetables, nursery, uh, you know, in New Jersey, we have tremendous diversity of the things that we grow, probably more than any state that I'm aware of. You know, things like cut flowers, sod, the turf grass industry. And of course, we still have the, tr the traditional row crops, the corn, soybeans, wheat, the forages. It's used extensively by landscapers in terms of both in the uh, plant hole or in landscape beds. It's being used now on golf courses and uh, parks and athletic fields. And even in some in instances with wildlife uh, habitat, we're trying to reestablish grassland habitats. And even, you know, this isn't cropland, uh, finished compost is even used as livestock bedding in some cases. So what are some of the sources? Already heard a lot about this already. This workshop today is focusing primarily on, uh, on animal, livestock related manures. Of course, you could also be getting the raw material to make compost from food processing waste. Leaves is probably one of the best known sources of compost material. And many times one of the, one of the really nice blends is to take leaves as a bulking agent and using that with manures if they have a carbon to nitrogen ratio and a moisture content that can make good use of that carbon in the leaves. I think most of the composting facilities in New Jersey are municipal uh, leaf facilities at this time. This is a, another take home message. I think we've kind of already touched on it a little bit, but I just want to emphasize it. Don't confuse composting with decomposition. Uh, I hear those words used interchangeably so much where people say, oh yeah, yeah, I got the compost pile about out back, you know, it's, it's so good. And it's all it is is a static pile of manure that's just been sitting there and it's decomposing. And just through Mother Nature's processes, you're probably getting some compost conversion in the center of that pile. But to really call something compost and to say that you're composting, it's a very specific set of moisture, carbon, nitrogen, air, and temperature parameters that you're meeting. Especially like the, the ambient temperature in the center of the pile, as we've heard before, is very important if you want to kill weed seeds and kill pathogens. You're not going to be getting that type of temperature in most cases and that type of benefit if you just have the, a static pile just sitting there. There usually is some management that needs to take place if you want it to compost in any kind of an efficient length of time if it wants to be used as a, as a soil amendment on a regular basis. Now the C to N ratio, of course, is, is critical. If it's greater than, than 30 to 1, it's been found that 
the nitrogen, you may have what's called a nitrogen depression situation in the soil where the nitrogen is being used by the bacteria to break that organic matter down. If it's less than 20 to 1, then the compost is going to act more as a source of nitrogen. And then uh, in between the two, it's, as you would expect, like all things in nature, it's kind of a gray area where it's sort of might be taken some, it might be given some. In time, it becomes a source of nitrogen after that initial breakdown takes place, very often in subsequent years. But if you're putting high carbon compost down that first year, uh, it's always going to need supplemental nitrogen. Otherwise, you're going to uh, notice it in the crops. Everything will be yellow. We'll get, we'll get into that a little bit. This is from a, a study uh, from Japan just showing how the addition of compost will lead to accumulated organic matter. You can see the top line is a high carbon bark compost and then way down at the bottom going across is uh, sludge and poultry manure coming up cattle and then paper mill sludge and then different types of uh, compost, rice straw, composted cattle manure. And as you would expect, as we're going up we're getting higher and higher carbon content with those co composts and of course subsequent accumulated organic matter is, is following along, increasing with that. And this is a, uh, a Idaho study that illustrates much the same point with the compost application rates uh, across the bottom and the organic matter content going up the left side. And you can just see you have two different applications there, uh, one in May, one in September. But the principle, it's just common sense. If you're putting it down and the heavier you're putting it down, the more the organic matter is going to accumulate in the soil. Um, the thing to also remember too is organic matter, uh, part of it is active and part of it is, is stable. And what will happen is a lot of the, some of the active part of the organic matter is the part that gets converted and becomes a nitrogen source. The stable part, which converts to humus, that will increase along with, so this is general soil organic matter is increasing both active and the stable part. Uh, the, the stable part lasts there and that's the one that really has the long-term benefits to the soil. It follows if we're, if you're having better conservation of that rainfall, less runoff and holding it in the, in the plant zone, they found it has a dramatic impact on uh, reduction of irrigation. And this is that point that I made earlier that the University of Illinois did a study and they basically proved this point that in the sandy soils the compost will increase the water holding capacity acting like a sponge as you would expect. And in tighter soils with a higher clay content it's going to improve aggregation and the water will move through. So it's like I said before it, it works both ways depending on whichever soil situation you have, coarse or, uh, or tighter, it's a benefit. And what they found was the plots that were amended with compost increased the plant available water by up to 45 percent for that crop that they were growing equated to uh, an average reduction of irrigation water to 90 percent reduction. So that's tremendous. Think of the energy and the water that would be saved if you experienced a, a situation like that uh, simply by adding compost. Plant disease resistance is, as I mentioned before, might be kind of an unexpected side benefit of compost. These are some of the more common plant diseases, anthracnose, phytophthora, and bacterial wilt that you might see in uh, New Jersey in a, a number of our crops, especially, especially vegetables. I did some looking and uh, EPA came out with a, a paper that sort of summarized why this is from a, a number of various studies that were done. They attribute this, this benefit, this uh, sort of synergistic effect that compost has that improves disease resistance on, on these four mechanisms. The beneficial microorganisms uh, successfully competing with the non-beneficial pathogens, if you will, for uh, nutrients then actual antibiotic production by the beneficials, uh, successful predation by the beneficials against the pathogens, and then the actual activation of disease-resistant genes in plants by the compost. So I thought that was pretty, uh, pretty impressive that you can get those kinds of benefits just from, uh, from compost. 
University of Connecticut did a study with uh, processing tomatoes to kind of illustrate this point. They did both uh, organic and conventional plots, where uh, organic obviously is pesticide free and conventional was more traditional ways of, uh, of production using chemicals. But they found uh, benefits with both methods of production, with anthracnose being reduced in organic plots and uh, increased yields and bacterial spot was reduced in the conventional plots. And they also found, which I thought was really interesting, that it led to earlier fruit ripening. Uh, and you recognize that the early market is the lucrative market. Sometimes as much as three weeks they found uh, earlier tomato ripening in the amended plots. So that equates to obviously a, a better bottom line. All right, so let's get right into actually putting, putting the compost uh, on the ground. A number of different application methods. A traditional manure spreader can be used, a rear discharge or side discharge. There are specialized spreaders, especially with turf grass, uh, athletic or golf course applications. I'll show you one of those. What type of spreader you use is uh, sometimes dictated by the consistency of the compost and the, the particle size and the moisture content. You need to have a certain consistency and it shouldn't vary too much because if you've got a wide range in moisture content and particle size with the compost that you're trying to apply, your spreader might work some of the time and not work so well other times. So hopefully it, it's, you have a fairly uh, consistent product. Uh, calibration of the spreader is critical. I'll get into that in a couple more slides. And it's of course important just like spreading any organic waste, uh, to have a consistent speed and know where you are in the field so that you're not having uh, skips or overlaps. So there's, uh, you've got a, a rear discharge, a, a side discharge, and then a, almost like a, a lime truck, another rear discharge. So you have a, a pull behind situation, a self-propelled, if you will, situation, and then a side discharge uh, pull behind. They'll all work with most types of manure-derived compost. If you're spreading uh, and you see this kind of a situation, well, it's probably not done composting yet. That's what we call immature compost. It's still really hot. This is one that you'd want to watch out for is spreading immature compost uh, because it's not going to have the same fertility benefits uh, and some of the other benefits that I've been detailing that a, a nice mature compost would have. And heaven forbid you're top dressing uh, an existing hay crop or any kind of a turf with that because it would, it would just burn it and crisp it right up if it was that hot. Uh, it's funny, I, uh, I had sort of personal experience with something similar to this just around my house. Um, we got a load of wood chips. And uh, so, you know, I'm digging into the pile and I'm noticing it, it, was, it was composting, it was hot. You, put, you, you couldn't put your hand in the middle of the pile, but I'm still, I'm throwing it on with the, with the shovel or the pitchfork around some areas around my house that were landscaped with, you know, your typical boxwoods and yews and what we all plant around our houses. A Couple days later I go out and it looked like I had hit some of the leaves on these shrubs with spectricide or some kind of a contact herbicide. The leaves were just burned on a lot of the plants. This stuff was so hot, it just cooked and this was woody vegetation. This wasn't just grass that I was spreading it on. So you can imagine if you're putting immature compost on anything that's growing, it's not going to be growing anymore. So calculation without calibration is pointless. But that's another take home message. Those of us that do nutrient management plans for people spend a lot of time with the calculator or different computer programs figuring out what the spreading rate is supposed to be per acre based on the manure or the compost nutrient content, and the nutrient needs of the crop. We're supposed to match the two. And it all looks really good on paper, but this is where it matters, is in the field. So if you give the producer the plan, and it's got the spreading rate, but the producer has no idea how fast the stuff is coming out the back of the spreader, and there's no effort at calibration, then all those calculations were a waste of time. So that's, that's a point that I don't think is emphasized enough. It's very important to do that. And there's all, uh, it's not that hard to do. It takes a little bit of time, but not that much. And there's 
plenty of sources for how to do it. Rutgers has a page on it, Penn State, Cornell. You can Google spreader calibration and you can find stuff just like that. So what's the application rate based on all those calculations? <clears throat> well, it'd be nice if you have an analysis of the compost at the startup because you don't really know what you're dealing with. And then if it's a consistent source, it's probably a, a good idea to still get it then once a year after that. You should be getting a soil test. Anytime you're applying nutrients of any kind to a field, there should be a soil test. And they should be done every three years. Because without a soil test, you really don't know what are the latent values of phosphorus and potassium that are in the soil, how acidic it is, what's the soil organic matter. And that gives you, at least then you know what you're dealing with. Because otherwise, you're just, it's just guesswork. What are the nutrient needs of the crop? is the next uh, basis for application. And that's where you put all that stuff together and that's where a nutrient management plan kind of pops out. Now in New Jersey, when we're doing a plan, anytime we're uh, working with a producer that's putting down any kind of organic waste, we use a phosphorus index, which is a basic tool that measures, it, it looks at five different parameters that just basically looks at risk of soil erosion, proximity to surface waters, how steep the slope is, what's your spreading regimen, those kinds of things. And it gives you sort of a general index as far as what's the likelihood of that phosphorus that's in that manure of reaching surface waters. So many times when we're doing a plan, it's driven by what our phosphorus index calculation came out to be. And then uh, the application and incorporation equipment. Is it surface spread? Is it injected? Uh, those kinds of considerations. It's important to remember that compost is not the same as raw manures or fertilizer because there's almost, as a rule, much lower nutrient content in compost than there would be in a raw manure. So if you were thinking that you're going to use the spreading rate, you want to spread on uh, an existing hay crop, and you find out that uh, it needs 20 pounds to the acre of compost, you put that much down on some, some grass, and you're probably going to smother it. So compost has to be treated a little bit differently. It's almost like a blend of science. That's the calculation part, and kind of common sense, too, where you have to make darn sure you're not putting it on so heavy that you're going to smother a standing grass crop. Or if you're putting down such a Heavy rate, if, you know, if your calculation told you 30 or 40 tons to the acre and you're putting it on bare soil, that might be too much organic matter for that, the, the life forms in that soil to then break down and assimilate without having some kind of a uh, risk of runoff or an odor problem. Um, so it's, it's not quite the same as fertilizer or raw manure because you have the potential to put on way too much if you're just basing it on your, the nutrient needs of the crop. So you kind of have to, you have to find a balance. I like to use the lowest rate possible and spread it in as many fields as possible because then you're getting the benefit of that organic matter, which is really the biggest benefit of the compost, and you're distributing it all over the fields throughout the operation instead of just hitting a couple of fields really hard and meeting the nutrient need. Uh, compost generally uh, needs to be incorporated and normal tillage implements can be used for that. Chisel plow, it's either straight or twisted shanks, tandem discs or disc harrows. Like with leaves, you can use the, the compost as a mulch and it can remain on the surface, which has a lot of soil erosion benefits because, well, we all know what mulch does. It's, we use it any time we're worried about soil erosion. It, prevents that raindrop impact on the soil, which then detaches the soil and starts to make it available for movement. So uh, you can use uh, composted material as a mulch, and then it's incorporated with the field preparation for the succeeding crop. Here's some of the basic implements. Uh, moldboard plows we don't see too much of anymore, but uh, we don't generally like to see them used too much because they're so hard on the soil they do complete inversion and they really burn up organic matter probably more than any other tillage implement but there's no law against them so there's still a few of them out there being used I'm sure. Disc plows, uh, chisel plows, those are something that's a little more uh, forgiving you might say and it still gets the organic matter incorporated into that top few inches. Low residue crops like veggies, nursery, cut flowers, soybeans, silage, corn, 
That's where the greatest value of adding compost or any kind of organic matter is because there's such an organic matter deficit. You're, you're, you're growing a crop that's not putting anything back. You're basically taking everything off or what's left is so fragile it breaks down in no time. Conversely, if you have a crop like grain corn or wheat or rye, if you're not baling the straw, those residues that are left behind are very beneficial and they can act like a mulch in the soil. So it's not as much of a benefit with these high residue, uh, good protective crops as some of these ones that I've got listed here. Um, it reduces the crusting that you get from low organic matter situations and intensive tillage and subsequently reduces the runoff and erosion. So when you're doing composting in annual crops, the carbon to nitrogen ratio is critical covered this a uh, little bit, you know, over 20 to 1 can be problematic. It's workable all the way up to 30 to 1, but that's where the nitrogen depression starts to kick in. So as I mentioned earlier, you're almost always going to need some supplemental nitrogen in year one, unless you're working with compost that have a, a low carbon to nitrogen ratio. And then in subsequent years, that organic matter mineralizes and it becomes a nitrogen source. Reducing the problem risk on these kinds of annual crop. Our standards, when we talk about waste utilization, we recommend no application on frozen or snow-covered ground. If there's a risk that if you get a significant rainfall event that would move off site, it's a good idea if you can to avoid steep slopes, uh, especially if they're proximate to surface waters. It's just kind of, it's common sense. You look around and look at what the risks are. And of course, consider odor issues. Wind, you know, your neighbors, wind direction, the timing, of your application, you know, try to avoid the morning of the 4th of July barbecue with the neighbor, unless you're not on speaking terms with that neighbor, that's up to you. But if it's really compost, the odor issues are minimal um, because it's, it, real finished compost doesn't smell that much different than nice rich topsoil. It's just that sometimes, you know, you think it's finished, but it's not quite, and you could have odor problems if you're not on top of the, the game. And of course, what we're best known for is soil erosion and runoff practices. These should always be considered when you're doing a land application of, of any kind of, of organic waste. You want to make sure that the compost stays where you put it and doesn't move off site. So some of the typical practices that we might recommend would be uh, doing all the agricultural operations across slope, as close to the contour as possible, which we call row arrangement or contour farming. Uh, contour buffer strips, terraces, grass waterways, and filter strips. I'll show you a picture of each one of those. And then that, uh, that little shot down there is Lancaster County, and that's probably from the 30s. So again, it's kind of the same idea as the, the other black and white of the, the farmer spreading the wood chips. This is stuff that's been around for a long time, and we know it works. So it's always a good idea to consider having it in a plan when you're using these types of materials. Contour buffer strips and terraces, uh, up, upper left, and then uh, to the right you've got a grass waterway coming right down. Lower left is a filter strip and lower right contour farming with buffer strips in between the rows. You can, you can just visualize how when we have grass runoff being uh, diverted onto stable areas, vegetated areas, it's just going to do that much better a job of absorbing the nutrients in the sediment and keeping it out of the surface waters. Here's another graphic that shows a bunch of them. Uh, I think this farm is somewhere in the Midwest. It's pretty self-explanatory. Of course, the windbreaks, uh, windbreaks can be used actually as an odor prevention or reduction practice, but most of the other ones there are more looking at filtering runoff before it gets to surface waters. Riparian forest buffers, which are sort of filter strips, but they have a woody vegetation component with it. Uh, the grass filter strips, uh, restored wetland, grass waterways that take runoff down the slope in a stable fashion. And uh, it's all typical practices that we include in a lot of our plans. All right, compost can be used in orchards. It can be used as a tree mulch, an amendment directly in the planting hole. You could do a full field renovation prior to a, a initial planting or a replanting, or you can do a full field application on an existing orchard. That's a, uh, a shot from Washington State where a full field application was done. 
But there's an example of how it could be utilized as a, as a mulch uh, directly around each tree, suppressing weeds and providing uh, low level fertility and for the organisms that are uh, around the roots of each one of those trees. Meadow restoration is another utilization of compost. This is a, uh, a prairie restoration that was done in Texas with Texas A&M. Berry manure compost was used. It was a highly disturbed site. And you can see uh, one year later the way the vegetation has already taken. It was an acidic site and one of the benefits I didn't mention too much was the neutralizing effect very often the compost has where it helps to raise that pH into a, a more beneficial one for plant growth. And that's a good example of that. Those warm season grasses and prairie wildflowers that obviously took nicely to that treatment. Compost on uh, recreational areas like golf courses and athletic fields has become another outlet, another popular use. This is a much different situation though than putting it on agricultural field that's going to be plowed and planted in the, the traditional fashion. It's, it's used as a top dress. The particles have to be very small because you're only going to put it on a quarter inch to a half an inch deep. It's like you're putting it on with a teaspoon. Very light applications. It's best done in conjunction with a, an aeration, a core aeration, which is an implement that's very common on golf courses and also athletic fields. It actually goes along and oh, it might punch out two to three inch cores all through the treatment area. Then you apply the compost and it makes it that much easier for this rich organic matter to get down into that top two to three inches of the soil and it kind of infuses life into that surface of the soil. And of course, just like with uh, all the ag situations, it has all those other benefits that we've already covered. So basically the process in a situation like that is you would do the core aeration and then the cores are raked into windrows because it actually leaves little two to three inch cores of soil on the surface if you've never seen it done. You collect the cores and then you apply the, the compost, a very fine mix of compost. In this instance, they use gypsum with it also to uh, help balance the soil uh, acidity. And then what you can also do is take the cores and they can be, usually what happens is they'll get mixed up and they can be used for landscaping or sometimes they are mixed with the compost and the cores kind of go back on also where they use, you can do it either way. You can just put the compost in where the cores were in those holes that are in the, in the uh, golf course or you can take the removed cores, mix it with the compost, and use that blend and put it back in. But it has tremendously beneficial uh, effects on these turfs that are really highly, highly managed. You need a specialized spreader for this type of situation. You can see how fine it's coming out, and it can work with uh, wet compost as well as dry. In landscaping, very common use in planting beds, Typical mix might be 60 or 70 percent soil with 30, 40 percent compost. Many times when you have a landscape situation, it's a disturbed site. The topsoil is nowhere to be found. You're working in subsoil around the buildings. Sometimes the stuff is like concrete. And mixing compost in these situations in the plant pots or in the planting holes or in the landscape beds themselves has a tremendous, tremendous impact. So compost is the greatest thing since sliced bread, but there are some possible negative effects. We touched on a few. I mentioned before the, the immature compost. I, the one point I, I mentioned about if it's too hot, you can actually burn landscape plants or turf. We mentioned the nitrogen depression. That first point, you can have phytotoxins that could be present in the compost that are basically they're, they're compounds that are toxic to plants and they could affect the crop if you didn't have a full maturity and development and stabilization of that compost if it was still cooking and some of these pathogens were still there. And of course you can have odor if it's poorly managed. And you could have, if you aren't watching the weather and staying on top of the situation, if you have a runoff event, a big rainstorm, right after you decided to put a nice heavy application of it, there's a chance that it's going to move off site and then you could have all kinds of problems. This is, I don't want to get into any regulations. Uh, <clears throat> you can't spread manure in a wetland, it'll pollute it. Nah, no, nah, I can't. The water's frozen. I'm good, you know. 
the point with that is um, there are regulations, and we'll have other people talk about that, but it's, it's important to understand the why of the regulations more than just the regulation themselves, because a lot of it will make more sense then. Follow up. Record keeping is really important when it comes to any kind of application of compost or, or manure. It's good business. It's good for your, you know, tracking your crop yields and your production practices. And it's also good to, if there's any regulatory situations that arise that uh, a producer can show that they were following their plan and they had a good handle on what was put down where and how much. <laughs> Spreader calibration should be done fairly regularly. Once a year is a good idea. Soil testing every three. Compost analysis is a good idea if the materials that are being composted are changing. Take a look at the field after a gully washer and see how good a job was done. Did the stuff move off site? Are there any erosion problems that need to be treated? It's always a good idea to track your crop yields with your uh, compost applications because then you, you're tightening up your, your management and you can be more efficient. And you should adjust your compost rates accordingly on any of the above situations. Rates should be adjusted. And of course, the obligatory for more information slide with the sunset. Thank you very much.